Hello, whole group leaders. Uh, we are week five Q&A and we're joined by Suzanne Bransgrove from Women in Family Business. Sorry, so many people to remember over this series. Um, we are, like I said, week five. And look, it's been an amazing journey so far. And it's great to hear the feedback from um, the panelists and the uh, participants who are jumping on, who are just starting to um, really see all the, the ducks fall into row in terms of how we've curated all of the content and the order of the facilitators and the content. I just said that, you know what I mean. Um, so what we're going to do is today's Q&A, um, we will take some questions and dive a little bit more into people's situations and I guess just expand on some of the topics that we were talking about yesterday, which is obviously family in business um, or business in family even, uh, if you reverse that. And I guess the dynamics that brings to relationships and I and the how those relationships can change the course of business in that as well so um I don't know Simone did you I know you're on at the moment and you had some questions as you weren't able to join yesterday would you be willing to jump on and just ask your questions so we can dive into it a bit more yeah sure um, and I saw that you raised some of them. I did, um, I was multitasking and watched the recording while I was doing dinner. So I kind of caught some of it. Um, and I guess my concern with, um, yeah, family business is, and I really um, picked up that whole dynamic about when you've got kids, regardless of what age. There is just, and I grew up in ag, so did my husband, um, I don't know. They just do. They do so much more than what their age is appropriate for. We often struggled with it when they were younger. Um, we have had them all on the payroll, the same as any casuals since they were sort of 14. Um, and we have a bit of a rule that if it's inside the garden fence, so mowing the lawn, doing the dishwasher, tidying your rooms, that's just part of being in the family. And, you know, so that's mum and dad get to be on your back and it's mum and dad. Um, but outside that, um, yes, they do do some things. They'll come down and just give us a hand. But if it's, um, you know, a set task, then they're on the pay roll the same as anyone else and they fill the timesheets in. Um, we do struggle with that expectation piece. We have the same expectations. If anything, we probably have higher expectations of them than staff. Um, which I know is not necessarily always fair, but it's equally, I think they understand they've been here longer, they've grown up in it, they know how the business runs. So it's really frustrating when, you know, they maybe have a slip because we probably do have that bar set fairly highly for them. So I thought that was a really, there was some discussion about that. I found that really interesting. Um, and I do have a question beyond that, but I'd just be interested in, um, yeah, where, sort of where your thoughts are with that and I guess how you manage that. It's something that's, I don't know, it just does concern me. And then equally because, um, you know, we don't have multi-generation in the business in that my in-laws have been out of the business for 13 years, um, but it is only my husband and I, and I, I don't know, like we've been married for, 23 years or something so we can communicate and we know our communication style but then my husband's not an amazing communicator and so I get really stressed about how he communicates to the staff and um and I think that does sometimes come through that um concern between us and then how we communicate with the staff I know when we've done exit interviews um staff get along with us both really well but it has come up in the past that, yeah, I'm a better communicator than my husband, yet he's the one that's much more operational and doing the day-to-day -day stuff. I don't know. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, was, I took a lot of mental notes of going, oh, this and that and this and that, but let's just see if we can, if we can move through. Um, the first thing, Simone, and thank you for providing so much background. So for children in a family business, it's um, and having your children in a family business, it's really complex from a, we talked yesterday about just how much they take on board from how you do things and how you communicate and how, what rules you set. And there are a few sort of um, little parts and you talked about being quite hard on them. One is um, how they're being viewed in the business by other people as well, and then how feedback works for them. So, um, and this is sort of where we talked about yesterday, there need to be some family meetings that 
that look through that and actually get some understanding and agreement and and put a bit of rationale and and also get their input into whether it works for them or not and i said that we come to the business side in a second um so um one is that the staff will look at them um quite differently and they will always worry and struggle with whether they are going to be in the business or how they're being treated and uh, staff looking at them possibly to have favor or to be different or to not be worth it and it might not be an issue while they're younger but as they get older as when they take roles that um, possible conflict between staff and your children can be can be a little bit um you know hard on them because without the reassurance that they are treated in a certain way because they're the decisions that you've made and for the business side to pick that up it, the reassurance that they've got a role to play and that they're not getting favors is going to be really important and the other part is what you're talking about the feedback loop uh, it's something to be really mindful of most children who grow up in a family business and Letitia you're probably going to also agree to this um, very rarely get um, objective feedback so the feedback loop either is um, they make mistakes and nothing is being done about it and they don't learn how to deal with their mistakes or they get punished more than they probably should and so this concept of looking at them as employees and creating uh, you know almost taking a step back and putting a bit of distance between what they've done and the response to it and really looking at it from a business perspective it's going to be really important um, from a culture and a staff perspective you know you and your husband are going to be different and you're going to have different strengths. What's going to be important is to sit down as business owners and look at who should be doing what and who should be communicating in the first place and not seeing it as a weakness, but it's just probably just a blind spot of a strength that he has. So his ability to be really operationally focused is his strength, but it has the blind spot you now of, of not being able to communicate part of what he needs done and so it might just be a matter of um, doing some you know even sort of strength testing or different other things and actually get to learn each other um, but to also look at um, and I'm not sure Simone if you've worked on your business values yes we um, have a value statement that we've probably had it for about six years that we did with our staff and I just reviewed it um, this year because um, none of the original staff that were here six years ago are still here now um, and so we just reviewed it and made statements. Okay. And how do you use your values throughout the year? Um, so very much it's when, and COVID has, um, we only have a small team. We have one full-time, uh, one permanent part-time, and then our three children are casuals and there's another three casuals as well. Um, in a normal circumstance, I would say we would have four, like, team meetings over a meal a year and what I've often done is I like to frame it in the um let's talk about the values and who's lived the values so or not necessarily it doesn't have to be a person but a situation so put it in a positive frame um so a really great example that came out I know a year or so ago was one of the girls said, you know, honest communication is one of our values. Um, and she said, I really appreciate when, you know, things mightn't have gone well in the morning shift. And I understand that that happens. But when I turn up for the afternoon shit, shift and I'm faced with a pile of shit, you know, like mess, um, she said, if someone sent me a text message and said, hey, I didn't get this finished this morning, you'll have to do that when you turn up to work. She's like, my mindset's there and I know I'm turning up to that so we probably try and frame it in that positive light like how's it work well um and that's and they're you know I mean they're they're on the wall um but it's not a that's just a I don't know I don't think people read it or people think about it and certainly when we induct new staff we talk about it um and what it means um accountability is there so they're all things accountability was probably the one that was non-negotiable for my husband and I um and we have a little saying it's the three f's and we tell all the staff this when we induct them and we interview them and um it's if you f up <laughs> then you fess up and then we fix it um and it's something that really resonates but um when we were doing the statements for our values um there were we kind of said well we probably shouldn't actually have that on our 
on our statement sheet. So we've got a mistake shared is not a mistake once it's fixed, but they all know what it means. <laughs> It's really interesting. I think values are the most underutilized and or sometimes even almost abused kind of concept. And I think abused because, you know, you have all these corporations with their values, you know, integrity, teamwork, and it means absolutely nothing to anybody. However, they're a wonderful way to shape language and, and create consistency of understanding of behavior and, and what it actually means. And it even can be used from a... Um, value should never be used in a threatening way but the concept of being able to say to somebody you know when you've done when this happened this isn't really in line with our value of and what probably might or what would have been better is maybe to do it to do it this way so all of a sudden it's not about you've done this wrong or there's something wrong with you it's not in line and that's okay because as you can imagine even you know respect or honesty or integrity it means different things to different people and and you can do so much with values even in your team meetings um, and through some people are more visual you can have whole sessions where people get to bring images and and share what they think honesty means or, or honest communication means or and you can you can put a lot of workshop and and sort of cultural fun around that and it just becomes part and parcel of how how people communicate with each other and how they are able to to articulate when they don't feel something is working. And it's the same with, you know, if anything happens between you and your husband, it's just a matter of saying, um, yeah, recognize your strength, but this is part of how we work. And just remember, this is something that's really important. I'm not quite sure whether that fits within your values, but, and I think um, values are an important part of, of culture and um, and can be can be used um, beautifully to, to start creating that alignment and um, working together. Um, and I said the only other thing I can think of is um, I love the Gallup Strength Finder, um, and actually the paid version of it, and um, looking for you know your main strength, and then having a look what the blind spots are, and and actually recognizing that when people do really annoying things, it's not because they're deliberately being difficult or they're being rude or they just can't you know it's just part and parcel of of who they are and how they show up, and and they need to understand and know it. But it's also sometimes just nice to be able to have a bit of. Um, forgiveness in in turn or in return for the strength that they bring and um, sometimes in families we can get really caught up on 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 the blind spots so what is that the gallup strength finder g-a-l-l-u-p strength finder yeah and um, there's a there's a paid version it might be about 30 or 40, I don't know, but, but it basically provides you your full spectrum of, of strength and they usually fall into execution or relationships and you might find that your husband is really good at execution and that might be his top strength or influencing but yours might be much more in relationships and then what I sort of sometimes say is well what do you expect so if you go to the one person if, you know, if that's not something that they're naturally good at then why expect them to behave that way why not just sort of look at you know, if, if you're better suited, then maybe there's an agreement that when it comes to communicating things with stuff, maybe that's just going to have to be your job. Yeah. You yeah. That. And it's interesting you talk just say like about the daily huddle and it's kind of almost like he and I have the daily huddle first and it's, um, I don't know, it's just, I guess, his expectations of that people will just see what needs to be done. He doesn't like, and he's right, you don't want to be, um, you don't want your staff or your family for that matter to feel that they don't you want them to stretch so you want them to go yeah I know my job and I've got to you know do this but um, he whereas I probably I'm probably an over communicator and so it's finding that middle line of I just need that certainty that the staff know what they've got to do today so because then we get feedback at times that they they know what their jobs are but then they don't know what to go on to when they finish that and he just expects that they will see that and he'll that they'll see the next thing and I'm like no people can't read your mind like I can (laughs) um so I think that kind of getting in the habit of you were talking us about daily daily huddles and then management yeah and then weekly and I've tried that. Um, it's it's making that space. Like, how do you how do you change the mindset to make that space so that these things happen and they're they're quite structured? 
So I love whiteboards for that, by the way. And um, sometimes in, in particular in family and farming family businesses, by the way, the concept of a debrief at night between you and your husband um, to almost prep the whiteboard for tomorrow in a calm setting as a, you know, just a, almost like a, a finish to the day, just to saying, hey, what got finished today? What didn't get finished? What worked well? What didn't work well? What do we need to focus on tomorrow? Let's just put this on the whiteboard and sort of basically almost have you know, the, the immediate items and almost like if that's finished and there's other stuff or this is what's going to be coming up for the week ahead. So then, and it's the concept of clarity for people when we talked about, you know, we talked about this. So for them, it means the more comfortable they are and the more clear they are, the more mental capacity will they have to think for themselves. If Because, and again, it comes back to everybody's different. And so your husband operates in a different way and, and not all of your staff do, and neither do you. So let's just, let's just make sure that we give everybody the best chance and the best opportunity to be as clear as possible for them to then find the autonomy within that and the comfort within that to maybe do extra or suggest new things. And so the more you open up the conversation with them in the mornings and, and also ask for their feedback and things that you might not have thought of, you're actually starting to find you're probably going to get more out of your staff, more import, and probably get more done. And, and actually, all it is is revolves around a big, a big whiteboard and making the time in the morning, um, and make it a bit. You know, it can be also enjoyable, but but that's how I'll probably go about it. And then implementing the family meetings, like to really segregate that. This is family. Like I know, um, like I even just observed last night. We probably started with the um hey there's a business you know our middle daughter's in year 12 so hey um we've been talking about this you know there's a business thing coming up you do know it's on the same day as my formal and I kind of went oh hell how did I miss that and I have some capacity and I was thinking it was gonna be five o'clock in the afternoon well it's not going to be I'm going to have to make sure it's 11 o'clock in the morning um and so there was that conversation that's a real overlap between this is where business and family collide but then we actually did just get into just real kind of family time last night and there wasn't um uh, yeah I was really probably quite observant last night that there wasn't any business talk after yeah. that because they also need to be children. It is all consuming. Um, and so there's the family time. And there's also said at some point, have a bit of a look at this um, Google family charter. So send me an email to see if I can just send you some of the questions that you might want to start you know, going through and, and just sort of start getting their input in um, and just get them to think about um, business and involvement and a little bit differently. Maybe they're a bit too young, but there, there's certainly um, additional things you can do. But I think it's wonderful to hear that you've made the time for that. And, and manage to um, not miss the formal. I, I think, well, I'm not sure given current circumstances that parents get to go, but obviously we, you know, we want oh, focus. Please. Um, I think it's just, well, ours are 16, 18 and 20 and they've all decided, you know, even our eldest, he's decided to stay living at home. Um, he has two jobs and he's working at university. Uh, uh, he's, uh, sorry, he's doing university and has two jobs. Um, so one in his field of, chosen career and you know and then he works for us otherwise um so I think they are old enough um they've been you know quite active and but I I often do I'm really happy I, you know their chosen careers at this point is two teachers and a nurse um and I think that's where you know I've got two that are it definitely educators the eldest two and the middle one she's pretty set on being a nurse and I'm very happy with their choices that's their choice um but I often have wondered it was probably pretty tough you know like we'd started out farming in the millennial drought and then you know we've had floods and then we've had you know like it's been a tough 20 years that we've had kids at home and they've probably seen the worst of agriculture and the worst of mum and dad really slogging their guts out and working long hours and doing lots of stuff and so I kind of don't blame them for not wanting to be farmers um, you know, they're probably going to be a little bit torn about that sometimes too. So their choices on a professional front to not obviously uh, be farmers, but to do, to have a profession that they can always go back to is, is probably, you know, partially because of that. But at the same time, I have no doubt that they're going to be worried about you and that they want to make sure that you're okay and that they are probably making, having some, you know, sort of subconscious thought and something just to watch as, as they get older 
that they're not starting to try to compromise because they want because they're so worried about what might happen to you and so this this is this concept around honest conversations um, managing sort of talking about expectations being honest with them where you stand you and your husband stand, what your plans might be for the future so they can also then either so say well actually before you for example before you sell it or manage it maybe it's something that we want to do but it, at all points make it about it's it's never about rescuing you I see this so often where where the kids sort of end up throwing things and just come back to to be the saviors and and make things work and I think it's just the more often you have conversations around how much you support their careers and that there are other options and solutions to to maybe manage the business or to sell it and that you you know you wouldn't expect them to come back and um and forfeit anything but if you know if yeah much, and I don't know where I'm coming coming yeah. from and that's been really hard because um, there has been that there has been an element of that going on, um, particularly um, so 17, 18, 19 in the drought, we were doing our early talk. And so our son is the eldest. So particularly even his HSC year. Um, so that was like 2019 was which was when it was the worst. Um, and he did lots to help he would come home from school and um and they do like the girls do as well and so I can see that and we probably are both torn with that at times which is why we're making some really significant um changes now because we want them to be able to you know focus on uni or get to the end of the get to the end of uni and be able to cut the ties and say you don't have to work on the farm you can 100% go and do what you want to do but while you're at uni you absolutely you know yes we provide you with employment and you know you're here at home and um I guess yeah that's the that's the thing about it's the family business you know we're all helping we're all pitching in but there does have to come a point in time where we need them to cut the ties and say go and spread your wings and we're very and, conscious of that yeah and that is this concept of these honest family conversations and really making it so normal to talk about um you know the decisions that you've made and why um for example with changes what you're trying to enable for them this honesty and so this possibility for them to understand that as individuals you they're free to pursue their purpose and their passion and what it is that matters to them that if you ever needed their help you you definitely talk to them about it so they don't have to feel that they've got to jump in without understanding or, or sort of maybe maybe not understanding that you're actually okay with it um, and equally the, the door isn't closed and that's just really a matter of regularly talking about these things and just keeping them all in the loop and up to date and just fostering this concept of sharing where they're at and what they're thinking and what they see and ideas that they have because the more you can do that the more natural are going to be any conversations when you start going into what's the more difficult stuff where it's around okay so what's going to happen is you might want to start retiring or stepping back or when you need some help so then it's not as if people because sometimes they might feel that they're not invited or that they are need to do something so i really highly recommend you just you know you're on the right path you absolutely are with where you've been going with this but just make sure you just keep it as normal as possible to talk about dreams and purpose and future plans and changes and even where things are tough or where hard decisions need to be made without anybody feeling that they have to do one thing or the other so I will, and Latisha, I'm conscious of time, but I will just tell you, so I did a, um, it just involved in different, um, you know, women's groups, and I did a morning tea this morning for online for, you know, celebrating um, International Rural Women's Day, mm -hmm. and, you know, we had a QA and a with some amazing young women, which was fantastic to see, um, and from three different sectors, um and I actually asked them the question about do you make time to separate business and family and conversations um so one she and her two brothers they do they um they all have professions and then they have um I guess they farm together on the side you might call it um and they have a business meeting every Thursday night and so she said um, if anything comes up between the, that time, they send a text message and said, hey, we need to talk business. So they're really clear. The other two um, are the same as me. They're like, yeah, nah. there's no separation between 
family and business it's just it's business all the time kind of you live and breathe it and I think we've almost grown up that we wear it as a badge of honor it's I think I think we kind of grow up with that's just you're in a family business and you um you know you live and you breathe your business and that's what's expected and that's what you do I think we need to change it yeah it, look it's in particular in I mean I do spend a lot of time not surprisingly with agricultural families because the, the whole issue around um you know the succession or the family communication transition issues because if they're not used to communicating and talking about things just imagine if you have to start having conversations around you know the kind of stuff that really starts pushing people's buttons so the earlier you start making this you know having family time and talk and really making people be equals in that conversation but also recognize that you know family needs to have a place next to the business individuals need to be able to have an outlet and need to have a voice it's not all about the business because in the end it doesn't matter if you put everything into the business and you break the family in the process then what have you actually what have you actually achieved you might have more wealth and you might have more assets but it's come at such a high cost and so as you just said you know separating making time and, and actually also sometimes taking stock and thinking about what life's really all about you know you talk about it, women are so amazing in that you know you talk we take on so much I, I did run a webinar at some point with a with a bunch of women in family businesses to actually talk about some of the different roles and what really fascinated me is that a lot of women say we didn't actually think we are women in a family business, we never actually occurred to us. We never recognized that not only do we play a really significant role in the business and we're very competent at that, but we also worry about our family's well-being. We want to make sure we nurture the children. We want to make sure that we keep the family legacy alive. We want to make sure that you know it can sustain into the future. And so the you know the what we forfeit as women sometimes or what we're actually able to take on is quite significant but this is sort of in particular when you know where Letitia and Holbrook come into it we don't have an endless we don't have endless energy and taking care of self and taking care of family and making sure that there's room for humans in that and they don't get swallowed up by the business it's just such a critical thing so I'm really glad that you've had your first family meeting yesterday and, um, and you know you can actually put little agendas together you can just make sure you have family dinners and then once a month you can start looking at it or you know people providing an update on what they're doing at uni what they're really passionate about what they're thinking about the future how they view the business what they've experienced in it have they got any ideas and you can share a lot about what your future plans are and you know what's been difficult what's been easy what you've learned so there are a lot of really rich conversations that are also you know your kids have got a really great um, training ground learning about business but you have so much more opportunity to teach them so much which is going to also be so important for them to be coming into any future conversations balanced and comfortable and prepared thank you then i think um as well you know just asking the questions of them what do you see for the future because i think a lot of um in that ag space a lot of the kids even though they may not want to work on the farm or in the farm business um they have this expectation that it'll always be there and their kids will be able to have a similar lifestyle to what they had and when that's removed or it's um you know that conversation's not had with them about selling the property or changing the the dynamics of it there's this sudden shock because they had this you know in their mind the farm was always going to be there um you know and that can cause a lot of grief I know in families I've you know it happened in my family and I know it happened it happens a lot in other families as well um and just on those personality tests um I've I didn't do the um Gallup one but we did another one in my organization my marketing company and you know there probably wasn't too much that came out of mind that I didn't already know but when it what it did show me was where I was able to recognize my knew my strengths but where my neat weaknesses were which I also knew it then allowed me to look in my team and go oh okay that's how that person balances out and they can support me so it helped us to define job roles really really well not necessarily by the typical job definition that may exist in you know society at the moment but frame it really based on those strengths and weaknesses and how to balance 
um, who does what, and that's a clear line of how it's going to work, but also helps you with recruiting. So you know that, okay, this is what we're missing in the mix of things. And we know that whoever we bring on and recruit next has to have this kind of trait to then sort of complete the puzzle, so to speak. Um, and it was really, really beneficial in helping understand how we communicate with each other. Um, and, you know, as Suzanne said earlier, you know, it, you can't fit around a peg into a square hole. It just, it's not going to fit. And maybe it's just a reshuffle. There's a really good book called Traction. Um, and it's um, Gino Wickman. And it's a really, really good book on uh, like staffing solutions and how to look at capacity do they want it? Do they need it? Do they have capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really good measure of being able to understand, you know, who you need to get in, how to manage those relationships, but also has a really good guide on how to run um, meetings. And they've got this 90 minute structure and we implemented it in our business of how to get through so much stuff in a 90 minute meeting. Um, and it's something that I'm also teaching some of my clients as well. And it's a game changer and, the whiteboard is a big, big asset in those meetings. Um, and everyone just feels heard. They feel like they get through stuff. So I definitely recommend having a read of that book. Cool. Oh, thanks, Latisha. All right, you can call me Tish. Um, <laughs> that's my nickname. Um, feel like we've shared enough, Simone. We're, we're at that level. I called you Sim the other day, I realised. No, that's okay. <laughs> I have a few Simone friends, so it just came naturally. But wow. um, thank you so much for jumping on and sharing, Simone. Um, you're an amazing sharer and it's great to be able, because that's how pe other people learn um, and people who may not feel as comfortable Asking those questions quite often, you're really, really helping those. So thank you for being that person. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much to you as well, Suzanne. Uh, this has been an amazing two days. And I know a lot of people got a lot out of yesterday's session as well. So if you missed it, make sure you jump on and watch that in any of the other weeks. Next week, you have me. Um, we are going to be talking about how your individual values sit in your business and how to make decisions around how you communicate and market and um, put yourself out there in a really authentic way that aligns with your values, but also attracts the kinds of people that you want in your business from a client and staffing perspective. So um, looking forward to week six. It's been an amazing few we uh, five weeks. So look forward to next time. Thank you. I was just going to say, and of course, I couldn't have probably positioned the values for you for next week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Deliberately, this is per fits perfectly. <laughs> hey, there's cool. method to my madness. All of this was uh, masterfully curated, so yeah, there was beautiful. there was logic to it. And you know that. And then following on from that, we've got um, creating smart goals with. Yeah. Um, so it all there's a reason that we've got the order that we do, and it'll slowly unweave by the week seven. We'll have a complete picture and look, it opens itself to a whole other series as well, but um, we'll get through week seven. <laughs> first. So no, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Simone. Right. Thanks. Bye.